हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम बैक टू द एनालिस्ट बैवाजी राम एंड रवि डेटेड टेंथ दिसंबर 2024 टुडे अगेन वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग सम इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक्स दैट इज अपियर इन टुडे इज द हिंदू एंड द इंडियन एक्सप्रेस न्यूज पेपर्स विच आर वेरी रेलिवेंट फॉर योर एग्जाम इन आवर फर्स्ट टॉपिक वी लुक इन द नेचर ऑफ टसल गोइंग ऑन बिटवीन आर गवर्नर एंड गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया सिंस इंडिपेंडेंस विल ऑल्सो लुक इन सम पॉसिबल रीजन्स एंड सम स्पेसिफिक इंस्टेंसेस ऑफ दिस टसल then in our second topic we we'll look into various aspects of issue of issue food security then in our simplified section we'll take up five articles and we will try to explain them in simplest language possible to enrich your understanding of the newspapers additionally we have also incorporated some prelims pointers which is going to be very important for your upcoming prelims 2025 exam so have a look on them also and stay tuned so our first topic is गवर्नमेंट वर्सेज आर बी आई गवर्नर टसेल द कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ दिस टॉपिक इज दैट मिस्टर शक्ति कांत दास जी टेन्योर एट आर बी आई कम्स टू एट एंड ऑन डिसंबर टेन दैट इज टूडे अमिड सम डिग्री ऑफ फ्रिक्शन दैट वॉज सीन बिटवीन द नॉर्थ ब्लॉक दैट इज मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ फाइनेंस गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया टू वॉज द एंड ऑफ हिस्स सेकेंड टर्म एज द गवर्नर ऑफ आर बी आई सो मिस्टर शक्ति कांत दास जी वॉज अपॉइंटेड एज द गवर्नर इन ईयर टू थाउजेंड एटीन and he got one extension in year 2021 but now the current secretary of department of revenue mr sanjay malhotra has been recommended as the new governor of rbi this particular topic pertains to syllabus of your gs paper 3 monetary policy growth and development so reserve bank of india was established on 1st april 1935 on the recommendation of hilton young commission and Initially, the headquarters of RBI was located in Calcutta, but in 1937 it was shifted to Mumbai, and as of now, its headquarters is still located in Mumbai itself. Originally, the RBI was a private-owned bank, but in 1949 it was nationalized. Also, for the brief period even after the independence on 15th August 1947, RBI acted as the central bank of Pakistan as well as Myanmar also. Also, the preamble of RBI talks about the overall functions that actually the RBI will be doing. It says that the RBI. describes the basic function of the Reserve Bank of India through this preamble that it says that to regulate the issue of bank notes. and keeping the reserves with view to securing monetary stability in india means first of all the rbi will be the issuer of bank notes except the 1 rupee notes and coins which are issued by the government of india and they will also keep a substantial amount of reserve to ensure that in case of any contingency that may arise in future they can ensure the monetary stability in india also to have a modern monetary policy framework to meet the challenge of increasingly complex economy to maintain price stability while keeping in mind the objective of growth okay so price stability means keeping in mind the target of inflation as well as the objective of economic growth they have to balance both the things but the question arises that is rbi a independent institutions institution to do all this thing or is there government interference that can happen and that has been told under the section 7 of rbi act 1934 which says that government from time to time or at any point of time give direction to the reserve bank of india in consultation with the governor of rbi so at any point of time if government of india feels that whatever the policy instance rbi is taking or whatever the work rbi is doing is not in sync with the objectives of the government of india then they can give directions to the rbi that shows that still there is subjectivity towards the independence and autonomy of the rbi there has been historical conflicts between rbi and the government of india for example in year 2003 to 2008 why we reddy ji was the governor of rbi and at that point of time again there has been friction between the finance minister at that point of time mr p chitambaram and the governor of rbi the various issues on which there were there were various tussles that went on was the financial market development for example finance minister wanted to deepen the corporate bond market he wanted to further improve the integrated financial instruments so that easy availability of funds can happen 
happen. But the RBI governor was of the point of view that as of now, the current economic situation is not that uh, prudent to deepen that bond market. Also, there was proposal to write off farm loans, especially during 2007 to 8 period. Okay, again, that uh, farm loan waiver was in uh, amount of almost 60,000 crores. So what the RBI governor said that is it will have far reaching impact on the banks, their lending capacities. Okay, so the RBI governor was not in uh, of the view that the, those loans should be written off. But finance minister said that those should be uh, those loans should be written off. There was disagreement on this point. Again, you have to understand this thing very clearly that why this disagreement actually happens because the government has some of the political compulsions. They have to win the elections also. And for that, they may come with some populist measures, which will not in sync with the, which will not be in sync with the monetary stability in the economy. For example, the farm loan waivers has been historically one such significant event or one such significant measure that have helped been garnering some of the votes to some political parties. That's why despite a greater financial or economic cost, political parties have advocated for writing of loans. But RBI governor or RBI as an institution who do not have as such political compulsions disagree with this point of view, especially for the populist majors. Then Mr. D. Subbarao, who was the RBI governor from 2008 to 2013, there was pressure for softer monetary stance to stimulate the growth. What is happening at this point of time also? The, what was the reason for the friction between Mr. Sakti Khan Das and Mr. Uh, and the government of India that there has been high inflation, persistent high inflation, especially after the COVID-19. But what we have seen that the data that has came with regard to the GDP growth rate, that GDP growth has slumped to almost lowest of last seven quarters. So the finance minister and the commerce and industry minister also said that there is need for reducing the repo rate so that EG loans can be available so that liquidity in the economy can be increased when EG loans will be available when expansionary monetary policy will happen the companies will get cheap loan and they will start producing more and that will create a cycle where production will increase then wages of the people will increase and they will be spending in the economy and that will further create a cycle that may lead to increased economic growth. But due to apprehensions of inflation in the economy, RBI governor was not of view that we should reduce the repo rate at this point of time. And this is this is this is one such instance which is going on since long ago because what government of India think that the growth is one such important aspect that should be kept in mind. That is the most important thing, especially during the phase where we have we haven't seen good economic growth in last two quarters or two three quarters but rbi wanted wants to balance both the price stability or inflation and the economic growth and this was the case in the uh, period of 2008 to 2013 also where the government was pressurizing for softer economic policy they wanted expansionary monetary policy they wanted to reduce the repo rate but the governor was not of not agreeing with that point of view also another point of contention at that point of time was growth formation of financial stability and development council which was created by an executive action and chairman of that was union finance minister also there has been a financial stability and development council subcommittee the chairman of that was deputy governor of rbi now it has various members like the heads of CB, IIDAI, PFID, etc. Then it have some special invities also like heads of NPCI, DFIs, etc. Now what this FSDC or Financial Stability Development Council do? It tries to maintain the financial stability. It looks into overall, overall issue that are plaguing the economy as such. That how we can maintain the growth of the economy as well as overall financial stability across the different sector whether it is insurance sector whether that is the banking sector or any other sector 
and it also enhance the inter regulatory coordination between different agencies between different regulatory bodies like iid ai rbi sebi etc so that the smoothness or policy coherence can happen in the economy also it supervise the economy so that the overall feedback can be taken from the economy that can be incorporated in future policies in future fiscal policies like budget making or the policy changes by the government it also promotes the financial sector development for example increased by the use of digital economy increased penetration of uh, insurance product increasing the insurance density as well as insurance pen penetration all that is happening from the feedback of these committees these meetings so the d subara was not very supportive of this idea of development of fsdc and that was again a point of contention between the governor and the rbi then during 2013 to 16 mr raguram rajan was the governor of rbi here again there has been contention when the governor protested the attempt to shift money market regulations to sebi governor wanted to shift the money market regulations to sebi so money market instruments of the short term instruments like t bills etc as of now the regulation of money market is with rbi but what government was thinking to shift this to the sebi but rbi has several apprehensions that open market operations etc that rbi do to ensure the price stability that would be very difficult if the money market regulation goes to the sebi sebi and it due to the protest of the governor and the further deliberations it it was not sent to the rbi also the governor disagree disagreed with the demonetization especially the cost that was paid and the results that was that uh, that we got for the with the demonetization so the cost benefit ratio was very less about the demonetize demonetization and he vehemently and in the public domain also criticized the demonetization and this disagreement on the demonetization was also one of the major contention between governor and the government also one major thing that before the demonetization it had, it is generally said that the raguram rajan ji the governor of rbi was not well consult, consulted also mr urjit patel from 2016 to 18 he again at this point of time the contention was the excess capital reserve that must be transferred from the rbi to the governor uh, rbi to the government of india so what happens RBI earns money through various things like open market operations that it gets, the interest that it gets on the securities, the money that it actually gets by printing of money, etc. So all that le uh, leads us to some profit or some uh, money creation in the RBI. So generally, it it has been felt that that money which was being generated by by the RBI through profits that must be shared with the government of India through dividends. but this excess capital that what should be the amount that should be kept with the rbi as a buffer and what should be transferred to the government of india again this was a bone of contention and under section 7 of rbi act the government gave direction to the rbi governor and further he transferred the excess reserve to the government of india also the lending norms especially the priority sector lending norms that was also government wanted to relax that that they wanted that some of the sectors like agriculture msmes etc get, get some extra loans so that the growth can be seen in on those areas in those sectors and rbi was uh, on of point of view that if we'll focus more on the priority sector lendings there might be a case that tomorrow that more bad loans may increase in the economy and the credit creation may also be jeopardized in future then in the case of mr shaktikan das ji who was the governor of rbi from 2021 to 24 on on december 8 monetary policy review the repo rate was steady at 6.5% and due uh mr uh, finance minister as well as the commerce minister publicly said that rbi should review rbi should reduce the repo rate but it was not done also we have to understand that rbi was prioritizing the inflation control which was not in sync with the view of the government which now thought that it is the high time to focus on the economic growth also 
again you have to understand one thing that this is the reason that we have created this monetary policy committee or mpc which has been formed under the section 45 zb of rbi act 1934 earlier there was a technical advisory committee which was recommending the changes in the repo rate but now there has been a statutory body which has been set up and through the finance act 2016 which is actually looking which is actually deciding the repo rate under this mpc there are six members okay three members from rbi and three members from government of india which is actually deciding the repo rate and the decision is based on majority vote and governor of rbi has a casting vote the mpc majorly whatever the decision mpc takes that will be binding on the rbi so what we have to understand that why government came with this mpc especially after the 2016 that there has been wide spread issue of the transparency opaqueness that how rbi is actually deciding the policy rate so government thought that let's bring a body which have representation from government also which have representation from rbi also and they should take the policy rate decision and that will help us in bringing a transparent policy rate that on what basis actually they are deciding so what are the major reasons for conflict the first is the policy priorities growth versus liquidity the uh, priority of the government is economic growth the major focus is economic growth whereas the in increased liquidity should be addressed well is one of the major important priority of the rbi because under the mpc also rbi has been given this uh, direction that inflation should be kept in 4% with a tolerance level of minus 2 to plus 2% means it should be from 2% to 6% but what we have seen in from past one year it has been breaching the 6% limit especially the food inflation that has been very high also dispute over policy independence that earlier the rbi and governor especially was uh, of this thinking that rbi while deciding any policy is completely independent without any control of the government they are completely autonomous body but time and again under the directions of section 7 of rbi act 1934 it creates the contention it it has created various issues then the surplus transfers and the capital reserves since there is no proper mechanism there is no clear cut direction that what much amount of reserve should be transferred back to the government of india and what should be the capital buffer that rbi should keep to ensure the monetary stability in in case of any contingency that may arise in future so this has been also one of the major issue you can see that in financial year 2024 rbi payout to center has been more than 2 lakh 10800 crores in financial year 2023 it was 87460 so again this is one of the area because government needs money especially for funding various programs various schemes and they think that this dividends dividend which is being uh, which may they may get from the rbi that may act as a good source of revenue for them so that is again this is a point of disagreement between the two then the conflict over financial and in economic reforms government thinks that if will over regulate the financial sector or banking sector that might jeopardize the growth potential that that might jeopardize the credit creation in the economy but rbi thinks that until unless we will ensure a fair regulation that might hamper the monetary stability that might create the issue in the future overall economic stability in the economy may be jeopardized in future for example the prompt corrective actions okay which has been taken by rbi on various banks so again that there has been disagreement over this also that what should be the mechanism based on which this prompt corrective actions should be taken that actually uh, limits the lending capacity of the banks etc apart from that there has been the issue over regulatory control over the banking sector for example the government fiscal goals versus prudent banking practices government fiscal goals has been to increase the economic growth to increase the credit creations but the rbi wants to ensure that there should be prudent banking practices for example rbi wants that the 
government the, whatever the banking banks bank sector is lending if there is the bad loan that should come in the public domain without that should be reported without any delay whatever uh, the sub assets or the stressed 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 assets that are there that should be uh, reported properly whereas the government wants that they should be re reported but they should not be overly reg regulated apart from that there has been issue about the public sector banks and the private sector banks since public sector banks has been controlled by both the government as well as the rbi that the appointment process of the top officials of public sector banks are seen by the government whereas day to day activities etc are seen by the rbi so there this has been again a point of contention where rbi thinks that it should be the complete domain of rbi itself who if will be given power for appointment process and everything as it regulates the private sector that will help in bringing more prudent banking practices in the public sector also the less number of stressed assets will be there with the public sector their lending capacities and everything will improve also the divergent approaches to the crisis management for example in 2008 economic crisis the financial stability versus quick economic relief measure that at any point of time that when in 2008 there was economic crisis it led to high inflation but again the economic growth was slumping so in the view of rbi the first measure should be that first bring our inflation to the toler tolerance level first bring to the uh, inflation to the limit but government wanted that inflation will come at its place but our focus should now shift towards the economic relief measures we should fo uh, focus on expansionary monetary policy measures so that people have money liquidity in the economy can be increased and this is the same thing that is happening especially after the covid 19 where rbi is thinking to bring back inflation in the uh, proper level whereas now government is thinking that this excessive tight monetary policy by the uh, rbi is leading to slow economic growth is leading is damp bring dampening the uh, credit creation in the economy so what should be done what should be our approach first we need to ensure that rbi's independence is very important for overall economic stability in the economy there should be open communication between the government and the rbi at regular interval that will help us in bringing credibility to the rbi as well as the public trust of the people towards these institution will further increase also we need to have improved coordination between the policies that both the rbi and the government should focus that with the communication with the coordination they should have same goal they should run the same race to towards ending that particular uh, goal that is to bring to make india a developed country by 2047 to make india 5 trillion economy by 2027 28 so these goals that has been set by the india should be achieved should be targeted by both the organizations that is rbi as well as the government of india so when there will be coordinated effort that will reduce the friction that will reduce the tussle and this can be possible by the discussion and sharing of information with the both the Uh, RBI as, as well as the government. Also, there is need for transparent use of RBI's reserves. There should be a clear-cut framework that can be provided either by some statutory mechanism or by some executive order that this this is the mechanism. This much of dividend should be given back to the uh, government in due time, and this can be the capital buffer that can be kept with the RBI. Also, there is need for clear rules on financial oversight with the changing economic conditions. we cannot have a water tight regulation which will be implemented throughout the year year after year but what we need that there there should be a dynamic oversight regulation that changes with the time and rbi is one such institution which has been well capable of regulating the financial agencies so they should be given better uh, powers they they should be given more powers and also there should be clarity on roles that what clarity uh, what uh, role the government will be paying and what the government uh, what the role the government will be playing and what is the role that rbi will be playing also the crisis management collaboration that at any point of time when any contingent situation may arise in the economy like 2008 economic crisis or the covid 19 or in future any such uh, crisis that is jeopardizing overall eco economic stability in the economy there should be timely and coordinated response from both the agencies okay 
it should not be done that one uh, institution is thinking that there should we should go for tight monetary policy and other is thinking that there should be expansionary monetary policy because this will again create confusion with the business houses with the private institutions as well as with the public also and that will again does not help in ensuring that proper uh, growth as well as proper price stability is there in the economy. Now you can see there was a prelims question that was asked related to monetary policy committee from uh, in the year 2017. You people please tell me the answer of this question in the comment box. A mains practice question that you people can write from this topic is this you people can write this question. Our next topic is the issue of food security. The context of this topic is that a lead editorial discuss various aspects of food and energy security. This particular topic pertains to syllabus of your GS paper 3, food security, mineral and energy resources. So the editorial says that nearly 70% of world fresh water resources and over 20% of greenhouse gases are emitted by the agriculture only. And this has been data from FAO. So it is again when we have to ensure the food security which means the availability, affordability as well as the accessibility of food. So we are focusing on increasing the food production but it is again creating some other issues like it is uh, creating pressure on fresh water resources it is also leading to emission of the greenhouse gases which is leading to climate change and further impacting the other agriculture productivity as well as is creating other issues like droughts incessant rainfalls etc and the rising temperature and erratic weather pattern which is also one of the main reason for is the rising greenhouse gases it is jeopardizing livelihood of over 2.5 billion and it is creating a risk to these people, these livelihoods. And it, this has been again the data from FAO. As per this global food insecurity rate, 11.8% of world population by 2022 and 2023 will have a food insecurity will face a case of food insecurity and it may reach to 9, 9, 956 million by the year 2028 and this has been again the data from FAO. Also this global food insecurity has been further amplified with energy poverty where people do not have access to proper energy sources whether it is the fossil fuel based energy or renewable energy because that is again impacting the agricultural productivity. Why? Because for the irrigation needs, people need money, people need energy to pump up the water from the groundwater. When they do not have that energy, especially the editorial has taken example from African continent. When the people do not have energy, they will not be able to irrigate the lands properly and which will again impact the agricultural product productivity. And when the productivity will be less, it will lead to higher food prices. And when there will be high food prices, the purchasing power of people will not be that much sound. It will deepen the poverty where people will not have access to even basic resources that is food, clothing and houses. So what are the reasons for global food insecurity? The first important reason is conflict and the war. Because what happens during the time of war, it disrupts the supply chains. For example, during Russia-Ukraine war, the supply chain was impacted significantly. Supply chains means this is the producer. Okay. Then let's suppose this is processor. Then suppose this is the wholesaler. Then suppose this is the retailer. Then suppose this is the ultimate consumer. Now let's suppose any commodity which was being produced in the Russia or in Ukraine and it couldn't reach the processing facility which is located in India or which is located in Russia itself and it couldn't reach further to the wholesale market in India. Why it couldn't reach? Because of disruptions that has been created during war. When this disruption will happen, when this conflict will go on, this will reduce the production of the food uh, cereals as well as food components and it will also reduce the supply chain, supply of these pro food products and that will limit the supply of these food products and that will further lead to food insecurity. Also the economic instability that high inflation and unemployment in majority of the 
कंट्रीज इट अगेन इंक्रीजेस द फूड प्राइसेस एंड इट रिड्यूसेस द परचेजिंग पावर ऑफ द पीपल फॉर एग्जाम्पल रिसेंटली द डेटा दैट केम विद रिगार्ड टू द जी डी पी ग्रोथ रेट इट सेट दैट द रियल वेज ग्रोथ रेट विद द पीपल हैज बीन वेरी लो मीन्स द नॉमिनल वेज ग्रोथ रेट माइनस द इन्फ्लेशन इन द इकोनमी दैट इज योर रियल वेज ग्रोथ रेट For example, your wage was hundred rupees, and the cost of let's suppose atta was again hundred rupees. But your wage has increased to one hundred ten rupees only in last one year. But cost of atta increased to or cost of flour increased to one twenty rupees. Then at this point of time, that person who was buying the atta from his hundred rupees that he was getting, he will not be able to buy that product. Why that is happening? Because of high inflation in the economy, and which is again being fueled by the supply chain disruptions as well as well as various climate change related issues like droughts, etc. In 2022, food prices rose to 20 to 30 percent globally due to inflation and supply chain issues, as per the World Bank 2023. Again, the population growth rate. Again. what is we have to understand that our resources are very limited L the land we have the fertile land that we have is very limited the rapidly growing population increases the demand of the food because th that is the basic necessity people cannot live without that and that is putting strain on the existing resources that we have for example the global population is going to rise to about 9.7 million by 2050 as per united nations population division 2022 which will further create the issues of the food insecurity then the poor infrastructure that lack of proper storage facilities transportation facilities for example the cold storage facilities lack of awareness about the proper storage facilities so this again leads to molds or bacterial infection in the foods and this lead to loss of the food product this leads to high post harvest losses also the processing infrastructure is very low and that is the reason why some of the perishable item which have a shorter shelf life like tomato or the vegetable products they again that again goes to the losses because we do not have cold chain facilities where we can uh, keep that for a longer period of time we do not have proper processing facilities so obviously it will lead to post harvest losses in sub saharan africa up to 40% of food is lost post harvest due to inadequate infrastructure as per fao 2023 also the trade restrictions and the policies various protectionist measures has been taken whether it has been between us and china where it has been various other countries that further leads to export bans and tariffs on food commodities that restricts the supply of various goods and services this can be either the tariff measures or that can be non tariff measures for example the sanitary and the phytosanitary measures which requires a basic bare minimum level of uh, quality in those products which are being exported from one country to another country for example our spices like uh, mdh masala everest masala has hasn't been accepted in various countries like singapore and some of the european union countries why because of there was high level of ethylene oxide in that uh, spices and which was uh, said to be not to uh, not to be fit to be uh, eaten in those countries so these type of measures tariff barriers and non tariff tariff barriers further leads to less supply of products and further damp increases the food insecurity also the growing demand on the agriculture on one hand agriculture is fulfilling the needs of food on the other hand our shift or transition towards the renewable energy sources like biofuels etc is also being fulfilled by the agriculture so that is creating a situation that is creating a dilemma that whether we should focus on food or biofuels for example as per the government of india biofuel policy it has been categorized into four generation under the first generation of biofuels it is made from food related sources such as sugars starches starch materials that are often a food source for people or animals for example ethanol that is being produced from the soya bean or the sugar cane or biodiesel from soya bean then you have second generation biofuels which is also known as known as cellulosic biofuels and these are made from non food sources such as agricultural residue wood chips waste crops etc then we have the third generation biofuels which are also known as algal biofuels they are produced from aquatic feed stocks such as algae 
and we have fourth generation biofuels which is at developmental stage and they are being used they are being produced using bio engineered microorganisms as well as genetically engineered feedstock so when we have this first generation biofuels which are being produced from agriculture sources then again that will create a issue that what is the priority that we should focus on that whether it is the food production or whether it should be the transition towards the renewable energy so what should be done what should be our uh, what should be our approach while addressing this first we need to strengthen the climate resilience means we should focus on climate smart agriculture what does means what does it means it means to sustainably increase the agricultural productivity and income also to adopt and build resilience of people and food system to climate change also to reduce and remove the greenhouse gas emissions wherever possible so what what does it mean that we have to focus on all the backward as well as forward linkages backward linkages means while seeds we need to focus on drought resilient seeds if we talk about the irrigation we need to focus on drip irrigation rather than flood irrigation which leads to lot of water loss then in the processing stage we should ensure that proper processing is happening pro proper transportation facilities are there we should also minimize the use of fertilizers etc because that will help in increasing the productivity and that will also help in a climate smart agriculture that can actually tackle the climate change related issues that are happening whether the increased case of untimely rainfall or droughts in the in the uh, any part of the world also we have to focus on the sustainable farming practices which is in sync with the needs of the environment we should only not focus on our needs then we need to promote the peace and stability in the world because we need to mediate the conflicts and we should ensure that there is a proper robust supply chains even during we should uh, during a case of war or war zones we should focus on safe corridors for food distribution as well as supply chains because that will help in ensuring that there is proper and robust supply chains also we need to enhance the economic support for that we need to implement social safety nets subsidies for vulnerable population support local economies for example vulnerable population like farmers they needs to be supported with proper credit proper money in their hand they should be pro provided proper price discovery mechanisms they should be pro provided proper remunerative prices for their products and also we need to support the local economies who are dependent on the agriculture that any point of time if they finds difficulty they needs to be provided proper capacity building and hand holding also we need to improve the global supply chains for that we need to strengthen the global food trade agreements between various countries and we need to reduce the logistic bottlenecks between various countries for example the turn around time that is there that one chip what is the time it takes to offload what is the time it takes to get various custom clearances etc that time needs to be reduced because that will actually help in ensuring that the supply chain is robust that will help in reducing the uh, losses in the travel that will also help in increasing the self life of those products and those products will be more ready to be eaten also we need to focus on the family planning and education for that we need to promote family planning and we need to empower the women we need to ensure that they have better choices while choosing the contraceptives while deciding the family planning we need to increase more awareness and education with the women also we need to upgrade the infrastructure we need to invest in the storage transport transport and processing facility to reduce the food wastages we need to also revise the trade policies and that will actually help in reducing the export bans high tariffs on agricultural commodities and we that will actually help in ensuring that there is stable food supply we need to ensure that all the non tariff barriers that is sanitary phytosanitary measures the quality control etc that should be in a rational way also we need to reduce the inequality where we need to address the income inequality through policies that improve the access to affordable food for that this let's suppose in india national food security act 2013 is there in place that has been very helpful especially during the covid 19 where government through this pradhan mantri garib kalyan anna yojana had 
given the subsidized food grains to the people. So these type of support measures from the government can be very helpful in ensuring the food security. Also, we need inclusivity in energy transition. Those countries which are energy poor means who do not have proper facilities, who do not have proper resources to transition from the non-renewable to the renewable sources, they need to be taken by various developed countries of the world. They should not be left behind because for them, they have dual task. One is to ensure food security and second to have a proper affordable accessible energy. So for them until and unless there will be support from multilateral institution, intergovernmental organization, various developed countries of the world, it will be very difficult for them to cope up with this issue of food insecurity as well as energy poverty. This is a main practice question that you people can write from this topic. In our simplified section, first topic is Indians need the right to disconnect. This particular topic pertains to slavers of your GS paper 2, government policies and interventions and welfare measures. This has appeared in today's The Hindu page number 9. So what does this article or editorial is all about? It is emphasizing on the point that let's suppose there is a person A who is working in this ABC Limited, which is a company. Now this person has been given the task or given the time to work 8 hours on this ABC Limited. Then the editorial says that it should be the right of this person that after completing his 8 hour shift, when he has came to his home or he has been gone to do any work to spend time with his friends or his family or even to do some recreational activities like meditation etc. There should not be any disturbance from anyone from this company neither by manager, team lead or anything else. If anyone wants to get any update, if anyone wants to get any report from this person A, he or she should message him, he or she should email him during this time of uh, hours itself during this shift of this person until and unless there is some contingency that has arrived. So this should be the right to be disconnected from his workplace after the office timing gets over. This is what this editorial is all about. Now after the death of the EY employee in September allegedly, allegedly due to the work pressure the member of parliament Mr. Shashi Tharoor said that he would raise this issue in the parliament and he said that inhumanity at the workplace must be legislated out of the existence. A recent report by the Hindu reveals that Indian women in professional jobs such as auditing, information, technology and media work more than 55 hours a week. That is almost 8 hours on all the 7 days means including the weekends also. Also the working hours vary for those who belong to marginalized section of society and work in the unorganized sector which is outside the formal regulation of the government. Because these people, these people's bargaining capacity is very low. They are in need of the money. That's why they do the overtime work. They often get more uh, exploitation at their workplaces. Also, as per the research by this ADP Research Institute, 49% of Indian workers said that workplace stress negatively impacts their mental health. As French politicians said that employees physically leave the office, but they do not leave their work. They remain attached by a kind of electronic leash like a dog and the text the messages, the emails colonize the life of individual to the point where he or she eventually breaks down. If you will travel with any of the metro which is coming from Gurgaon to New Delhi or going from New Delhi to Noida area, you will see most of the working population is still on their phones connecting with their peers, connected with their managers, with their peers where either they are giving reports or they are taking reports from their peers. So means they have left the premises of that company but still they are connected with their work. Why? They are not doing it out of happiness, but they are doing it out of compulsion. They will have to do that. Because if at this point of time they are not ready to do, do this, 10 other peoples are ready to do their work at a lower cost that was being given to that people. So due to this high unemployment in the economy where there is very less number of jobs, good jobs available with the people, again this creates an issue where there has been high exploitation of the people. If you talk about the international laws on the right to disconnect, in France, we have Labour Chamber of French Supreme Court which says that 
द पीपल आर नॉट ऑब्लीगेटेड टू वर्क फ्रॉम होम और कैरी वर्क रिलेटेड टूल्स आफ्टर वर्क दे शुड डू एट देयर वर्क प्लेस ओनली देन इन पुर्तगाल वी हैव इलीगल फॉर एम्प्लॉयर्स टू कॉन्टैक्ट एम्प्लॉयज आउटसाइड वर्किंग आर्स एक्सेप्ट ड्यूरिंग एमरजेंसी और एनी कंटिजेंसी सिचुएशन इन स्पेन आर्टिकल 88 ऑफ ऑर्गेनिक लॉ थ्री ऑब्लिक ट्वेंटी एटीन पब्लिक वर्कर्स कैन डिसकनेक्ट वर्क टू प्रोटेक्ट देयर पर्सनल टाइम एंड प्रिवेसी इन ऑस्ट्रेलिया द फेयर वर्क लिजिस्लेशन अमेंडमेंट रिकोगनाइज द एम्प्लॉयज राइट टू डिसकनेक्ट आफ्टर वर्किंग आवर्स देन इन आयरलैंड वी इट हैज अगेन रिकोगनाइज दिस राइट दैट एनशोर्स द वर्क लाइफ बैलेंस ऑफ द एम्प्लॉयज इन इंडिया ऑल्सो आर्टिकल थर्टी एट अंडर द डायरेक्टिव प्रिंसिपल ऑफ स्टेट पॉलिसी विच इज अगेन अंडर द पार्ट फोर ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इट मैंडेट्स द स्टेट टू प्रमोट द वेलफेयर ऑफ द पीपल आर्टिकल थर्टी नाइन ई अगेन अंडर द डीपीएसपी डायरेक्ट द स्टेट टू इंश्योर द स्ट्रेंथ एंड हेल्थ ऑफ वर्कर इट इज द ड्यूटी ऑफ द स्टेट टू इंश्योर दैट देर इज प्रॉपर वर्किंग इन्वायरमेंट देर इज प्रॉपर फेसिलिटी अवेलेबल दैट पीपल कैन वर्क प्रॉपरली वेर देर इज देर प्रोडक्टिविटी इज इंक्रीज वेर देर इज नो हेल्थ रिस्क इन्वॉल्व ऑल्सो द विशाखा केस इन नाइनटीन अंडर दिस ऑल्सो सुप्रीम कोर्ट रिकोगनाइज द राइट टू डिग्निटी एट द वर्क प्लेस then in case like ravindra kumar dharwal versus union of india 2021 the supreme court again says said that dignity and the mental well being at the work is of utmost important because due to this mental agony that people are facing it is leading to lot of health issues it in, it is also impacting the familial re relation where divorce rate are increasing where the socialization which was actually being done by the people earlier which was being done by the mother and father earlier is they they do not have time to spend with their uh, kids and uh, to go for that socialization people do not have time to spend with their parents and this is also leading to several he several health complications like high blood pressure cardiovascular diseases etc in 2018 mp supriya sule introduced this private member bill in the lok sabha which delineated the right to disconnect from work after working hours and the bill included the provision of penalty of 1% of the total remuneration of all employees to be paid by companies for non compliance with these provisions but obviously it was not passed so it is the right time that we need to discuss we need to deliberate this topic more uh, in the society and there should be at least more deliberation in the society so that a good way forward can come our second topic in the simplified section is related to the national food security act which is again related to your gs paper 3 agriculture subsidy and food security and this has appeared in today's the hindu page number 12 so the context is that the lawyer tell the supreme court that the national food security act is still driven from the figures of 2011 census means the beneficiary list which is been provided for national food security act is getting the data from 2011 census which is somewhat outdated and needs to be updated so if you talk about the national food security act salient features it has been passed in 2013 and the public distribution system is now governed by the provisions of this nfsa act 2013 and the coverage under the pds is delinked from erstwhile poverty estimates that earlier the pds or public distribution system or food grains were being provided by the poverty level only that below poverty line people will get this much amount the act now cover nearly 2/3 of the country's population based on the population of 2011 census 75% of rural and 50% of urban population is entitled to receive highly subsidized food grains under the two categories that is antodaya anna yojana and households uh, antodaya anna yojana households and priority households the state wise and ut wise coverage is determined by the erstwhile planning commission which has been now the niti ayog on the basis of 2011 pel household consumption expenditure survey which has been done by the nsso the under the act 35 kg of food grains will be provided to antyodaya ann yojana households okay they are given more support because they are somewhat the more poor and they need more support and 5 kg of food grains will be provided to priority households which are somewhat well to do in the society 
द आइडेंटिफिकेशन ऑफ बेनिफिशरीज अंडर द एन एफ एस इज डन बाई द रिस्पेक्टिव स्टेट और द यूनियन टेरिटरी गवर्नमेंट इट इज नॉट डन बाई द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट विच इज रिक्वायर्ड टू फ्रेम इट्स ओन क्राइटेरिया दैट बेस्ड ऑन विच दे विल बी आइडेंटिफाइंग द बेनिफिशरीज द हाईली सब्सिडाइज सेंट्रल इशू प्राइस ऑफ रुपीज वन टू एंड थ्री फॉर कोर्स ग्रेन वीट एंड राइस रिस्पेक्टिवली केप्ट अनचेंज टिल जून टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन सेंट्रल इशू प्राइस इज द प्राइस एट विच द ग्रेन्स आर मेड अवेलेबल टू द स्टेट्स टू बी सोल्ड थ्रो द फेयर प्राइस शॉप्स ऑल्सो द देर हैज बीन नो रिडक्शन इन एलोकेशन टू एनी स्टेट और यूटी अंडर द एन एफ एस ए द एल्डेस्ट वुमेन दिस इज द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट ऑफ द बेनिफिशरी हाउस होल्ड एटीन ईयर्स और एव इज कंसिडर्ड द हेड ऑफ द फैमिली फॉर द पर्पज ऑफ इशूइंग रेशन कार्ड्स और राशन कार्ड्स this has been this aim has been mainly to increase the women empowerment in the society if there has been no female member above the 18 years of age at the point of issuance of ration card at that point of time any male member can be made head but at any point of time when any female member will attain the age of 18 she will be made the head of the family also there has been the grievance redressal mechanism state food commission vigilance committee at different level has been provided to ensure there is a smooth distribution of food grains without any corruption also the provisions for disclosure of record related to the pds operation placing the beneficiaries list in the public domains for enhanced transparencies also the assistance to state uts for meeting the expenditure on intra state transportation handling of food grains and fps de dealers margin this has been one question related to this national food security act this has been asked in year 2018 and again this was a very basic question even if you have idea about this statement too you can get the answer of this question you people please tell me the answer of this question in the comment box in our next topic of simplified section the topic is that supreme court said said that reservation cannot be on the basis of religion it should be based on the socially and educationally backwardness this particular topic pertains to syllabus of your gs paper 2 social empowerment government policies and interventions and this has appeared in today's indian express page number 9 so the supreme court said that the reservation cannot be based on the religion at it was hearing the various pleas challenging the calcutta high court verdict which has nullified the west bengal government decision to classify 77 communities which were mostly from one particular community as obc for reservation benefits the supreme court said that reservation cannot be on the basis of re religion and it is but backwardness which has been upheld by the court means it should be the reservation should be based on the backwardness and there should be a proper data to support that backwardness and that data should be maintained by the state itself now what are the relevant constitutional provision related to the reservation as per article 15 of the constitution it empowers the state for making following provisions under the article 15 3 it enables the state to make any special provisions related to women and children under the article 15 4 it enables the state to make any special provisions for advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes then under the article 15 5 it it allows for special provisions for admission to educational institution including private ones for this socially and educationally backward classes of citizens then under article 15 6a it again provides for several provisions related to advancement of economically weaker section of society and which has been provided by one recent constitutional amendment act now you people tell me in the comment box that which was the constitutional amendment act which provided for the reservation to the ews class then under the article 164 it provides for the special provisions to be made for the classes which are not adequately represented in the services under the states under the state then under the article 166 it provides for some special provisions in favor of any economically weaker section of society okay which are not adequately represented in the state services so when they are not adequately represented they will be provided some reservation and in this way their representation can be improved in our next topic it is about that prevention of sexual harassment 2013 should be applied to political parties also in this regard supreme court said that the supreme court was hearing one petition and the uh, supreme court said that the 
petitioner should first go to the election commission of India and based on their feedback or whatever they say, it would be then decided. This particular topic pertains to syllabus of your GS paper 2 issues related to women and this has been appeared in today's The Hindu page number 12. So what this prevention of sexual harassment act or sexual harassment of women at workplace prevention prohibition and redressal act 2013 talks about what does it says it says that first it defines the sexual harassment that there any implied or explicit promise of preferential treatment in employment or any implied or explicit threat of detrimental treatment in employment or any interference during the course of work or creating any intimidating or offensive or hostile work environment or humiliating treatment which is likely to affect the health and safety of the worker or that will be considered under the sexual harassment. Also the circumstances that would constitute the sexual harassment that all has been defined under this Bosch Act. Then there has been an internal complaint committee which should be formed for any company or any place which have more than 10 employers. Also a formal sexual harassment complaint can be filed by any woman through this internal commit complaints committee. Also they will have to a minimum of four member in the, in the internal complaints committee and half of them should be women only. Then we have the local committees to look into all the issues or all the complaints of the sexual harassment related to the places where less than 10 numbers of employee are there. Also the particular act defines an employee, it expands the definition of workplace not only limited to the place of work where it is working or even in the case that outside the work environment if a person is intimidating anyone that can be again considered under the sexual harassment. However, the implementation of this particular act has been very lackluster. The major reason for the less awareness among the women also the intimidation by the employer the fear of losing jobs or the stereotypes in the society were some of the reasons that why there has been very low implementation of this particular act. So our next topic is Ayanash Tushil has been commissioned into Indian Navy. This particular topic pertains to syllabus of your GS paper 3 defense technology and this has appeared in today's The Hindu page number 12. So this Ayanash Tushil which is a collaborative effort of India and Russia and it is an upgraded Krivak third class frigate of project 1135.6 which is a project to develop some of the uh, frigates between India and Russia and there are six frigates which are already in service and this INS Tushil is seventh in this series. Also, there are three Talwar class ships which has been already in, uh, commissioned and three Teg class ships which has been already in place. These Talwar class ships are multi-role warships designed for anti-air, anti-surface as well as anti-submarine warfares and it has been obviously developed with the collaboration between India and Russia. Whereas this Teg class is such a, a particular warship which is designed with focus on anti-surface and anti-air capabilities and it, it is more advanced system which can engage multiple threat at one point of time and more indigenous technologies of the India are used in this TEG class ships. Also this INS Tushil which is designed for blue water operations across this spectrum of naval warfare mean it can have better it is it has better radar capabilities it is equipped with better advanced technologies to actually deal with multiple threats at any one point of time also the second frigate after this INS Tushil which will be commissioned is INS Tamil which is possibly will be commissioned in next or upcoming years this was all from today's analyst thank you very much all the best <laughs>